Hey guys, it's Miss Turner. We're going to film video today for tube feeding, uh, checking residual, flushing your, your peg tubes or your feeding tubes, how to administer meds through a feeding tube, and then how to actually give a feeding. So it's going to be quite a long video. What you're actually going to be tested out on is the process of checking placement, checking residual, um, and administering medications through a feeding tube. So we're going to do that piece of it first, and then I'm going to show you all about feedings at the end. So you'll get to see that at the end. First, I wanted to show you all of the supplies that I have. First, I definitely want to have a stethoscope handy because uh, that's going to be involved potentially in checking placement of your tube. If you're going to administer feeding, you want to make sure you have the right type of feeding. Today, we have Jevity Plus as our type of feeding, and this is going to be one can. Uh, your medications, if you are going to administer medications, you may bring them in with you at the beginning or you may come in and check your patient's feeding tube and do all of that and then go get your medications. For this sake, I just brought everything in with me. I have my MAR uh, with me. I have a feeding tube bag with me in case I'm going to administer the feeding through a bag or through the pump. Um, my INO sheet will be used later for documentation purposes. I have an irrigation tray. That inside of it is going to have my irrigation set up, so it's going to have a basin. It's going to have a syringe here that I'm going to use to administer the flush um, and also to administer the medications and check placement and residual. That's good for 24 hours, so you want to make sure when you open it, you label it. Sterile water. Um, some places you will see them using tap water. Most of the time in the acute care setting, we use sterile water, um, but it'll be to depend on your policy. Certainly, patients at home use tap water. I have a drain sponge here, so it's the sponge that's got the little slit in it because this does go around the peg tube. I have a blue clamp to clamp off the tube in between uh, administering the flushes and feedings and some uh, those types of things. You might want to use a clamp if your peg tube doesn't already have a clamp on it. So for long-term care purposes, since most of you will probably end up working in long-term care or taking care of patients uh, who have some kind of long-term illnesses, we're going to talk about a peg tube and I'm going to show you everything on a peg tube. But you can also do all of these things through, through this tube here, which is the dual feed tube. So this tube actually goes in through the nose. Um, it's inserted uh, by usually a mid-level provider or an RN and it hangs out of their nose um, and we administer feedings through this. This is much more of a temporary option, you know, a couple of weeks uh, at the most usually. This can cause some corrosion on the nose. It also increases the risk for aspiration as this tube goes down their esophagus through their lower esophageal sphincter, it actually could allow for gastric contents to reflux up and go into the respiratory system, which we don't want that to happen. With your PEG tube, on the other hand, you have less risk for aspiration and less risk that it's in the wrong place. So I'm going to show you over here on the mannequin the PEG tube. So it's usually a little bit shorter in length. It has usually a couple of different uh, areas in which we can administer feedings or flushes. It also has this on it, just like on your Foley catheters. There's actually a balloon inside here that's inflated holding this inside your patient. Some PEG tubes have it, some don't. So you'll have to determine that when you uh, see your patient. Then you see that there's a nice dressing over this. You want to make sure this dressing is nice, clean, dry, and intact. You'll change it per policy at your place of employment. Usually what I do is just change it whenever it's soiled or dirty. Especially new PEG tubes are going to have some drainage coming out of them, so it might need to be changed quite frequently. Once that PEG tube's been in for a while, there's a lot of scar tissue built up. You might not even need a dressing around it. Sometimes people at home don't have dressings around it. It really depends. Um, sometimes we just put it around it just for protective purposes um, and make the, the area nice and clean. So I'm going to show you how to give a feed, give meds, flush, check placement, and everything through this peg tube. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with all of those now. So I'm just going to get rid of my dual feed here. You'll be able to see this in the lab. My dressing looks nice, clean, dry, and intact. Um, it looks like it was put on this morning at 7 a.m., so I'm not going to worry about changing that today. But this will be available uh, for you in the lab if you wanted to see it and uh, play with it. So the first thing I'm going to do when I'm doing anything with my feeding tube is I want to make sure that it's in the right place, and I want to check for the residual volume. If you think back to class, I'm sure Ms. Blackmore talked about residual volume. I talked about residual volume and nutrition, and that's the volume that's left over in the stomach. So we always want to make sure before we give another feeding or we put you know, some medications into their stomach that they're tolerating the feeding that's already in or was given to them before or is kind of continuously going into them. 
So you'll need your irrigation set, and I'm just going to pretend that I date timed and initialed this 24 hours. I'm going to open my sterile water and date time and initial that as well. I'm going to pour some of my sterile water into my irrigation set. I want you to think that, uh, remember too, that the GI tract is not a sterile environment. So unlike a lot of the skills we've been doing over the last couple weeks, where we did trach care um, and we did uh, Foley catheter insertion, this actually is not a sterile procedure. Um, so you're not going to have to worry about that as much as you had with the other skills. So I'm going to pour maybe 100, 150 in there, depending. Um, if I'm going to give medications, I'm going to flush before I give medications. I'm going to flush after I give medications. If I have an ordered water flush, say the doctor has ordered for the patient to have 100 milliliters of water every four hours, uh, that might change the volume that I want to put in here. So it will depend on what you're going to do. For the case of passing meds, usually you can flush with 30 before and 30 after, but you would definitely want to make sure that you check with policy at your place of employment uh, so that you know exactly what the policy is. So I'm going to go over to my PEG tube here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to check for placement and I'm going to check for residual volume at the same time. Um, so my syringe is empty. I'm going to take my blue clamp if necessary. I can clamp it around the PEG tube so that when I open the end of it, I don't get a whole bunch of feeding or anything coming, squirting back out. You may want to get a towel and put that underneath. Sometimes this is a messy procedure. Sometimes we can't deal with that. You're going to put gloves on uh, to make sure that you're not getting any of this gastric contents you know, onto your hands. You're going to open, instill your syringe into the end of it. You're going to unclamp, and the first thing you're going to do is pull back on the plunger. You're going to pull back till you meet resistance. And this is going to do a couple of things. You're probably going to get some contents into your syringe here. Okay, you're going to pull back until you meet resistance and you literally can't pull back any farther. The volume that then comes into the syringe is what we consider our residual volume. Usually it's like less than 100 uh, is okay or if they're not getting any feedings, you really don't usually want more than 25 or 50 just plain gastric content sitting in their stomach. That's going to tell you something's wrong. But again, you want to check with your policy of where you're going to work to see what the recommendation is. Sometimes it's if they're getting a continuous feed, it's two and a half times the rate at which they're getting the continuous feed um, that you want to start being concerned. Uh, usually if you're getting anything less than the syringe full, you're usually pretty okay. You know, this is all they have in their stomach. So the last feed that they had three or four hours ago probably is mostly digested and that they're doing okay and they can tolerate you putting more substances, more liquids, medications, whatever it may be, into their stomach and they're going to be able to digest it. So I'm going to look on there. This looks like it's about 25 milliliters of residual volume. So I'm going to uh, push that back into my patient because I don't want to discard that. It's got lots of electrolytes in it and actually can throw somebody's electrolyte counts off if you get rid of a whole bunch of their gastric uh, contents. The other thing that this has done when I pulled back on this is it's shown me that more than likely I'm in the stomach. So the tube is still in the right place. Because I'm getting gastric contents, here I'm actually getting old tube feed. Uh, it tells me, yeah, I'm probably in the stomach. I wouldn't be in the peritoneal space and expect to be getting tube feed or gastric contents. If you were doing this in the duo feed and you pulled back um, and you didn't get gastric contents or you didn't get anything at all, or the same with the peg tube, you couldn't 100% for certain then say that you were in the right place because you got nothing. Usually in a peg tube, you're a little bit more easily able to get some gastric contents because the diameter of the tube is larger and you have a much shorter distance to pull those fluids. When you're talking about that dual feed that's going from their nose all the way down to their stomach, that tube is very, very small in diameter. It's very easily collapsible when we pull back on the syringe. It creates negative pressure in there and collapses the tube. So often you're not going to get anything when you pull back. In this case, I did. So I could say, yeah, I'm pretty certain that this tube is in the right place. If I was still uncertain after pulling back on the end of the syringe, um, I could do one other thing. And you're going to see this these things happening uh, both together sometimes. Uh, used to, the recommendation used to be 100% of the time we instilled air, we listened, and that was how we knew it was in the right place. The practice is changing a little bit, so you're going to see both of these things happening. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull up about 10 to 20 milliliters of air in my syringe. 
unclamp the blue clamp. I'm going to take my stethoscope off, place it over the stomach, and at the same time, I'm going to push this air into the stomach. When I do that, I should hear this kind of swooshing noise that tells me that that air went into the stomach and now hopefully confirming the fact that my tube is actually in the right place. Again, with a PEG tube, we don't have as much risk for aspiration and we don't have as much risk for this tube to be someplace else, like in the lung. This tube's either gonna be in the stomach or it's gonna be in the peritoneal cavity. So hopefully by pulling back and getting gastric contents, you're pretty well assured that it's in the stomach and you can proceed with flushing and giving your medications or flushing and giving your feed. If you have a dual feed though, that tube actually can come up into the esophagus. It could be up high in the esophagus. So if you went to give medications or tube feed, it could go right into their respiratory tract, into their lungs and you could, you could aspirate. Uh, they could aspirate on those contents. So a couple of differences between the PEG tube and the dual feed. But, so I went through the first step, I checked residual. So my residual volume is 25 milliliters and I checked placement both by pulling back and confirming that I have gastric contents and also by instilling some air. So I'm absolutely sure that this tube is in the right place and I'm sure that they're tolerating what's already, what they've already received today. So I can go ahead and give my medications and then give my flush and my feed or whatever else is ordered for my patient. Anytime you're doing anything with a feeding tube, you always want to do those steps, no matter what. You always want to make sure it's in the right place before you give something. You always want to make sure that the residual volume is small enough that you know you're not going to add more to their stomach and they're not going to be able to tolerate it. So I'm going to show you now how I'm going to prepare my medications to administer them through a tube. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to administer a tablet and a capsule. There's a couple of things you can't crush and give through a feeding tube. Those are your enteric coated tablets. They have a special coating on them that allows them to be a little bit more, uh, less aggressive on the stomach and allows them to be more digestible in the small intestine and not cause gastritis or inflammation in the stomach. Time release tablets you don't wanna crush because then there's no time release part of it. You've kind of disrupted that and they're gonna get all that medication at one time And I think that's it. I was thinking there was a third thing, but I can't think of it now. So you're gonna give a capsule and a tablet. So a tablet is gonna to have to be crushed. So certainly you wanna have your MAR. You've already done two checks outside of the room um, to make sure that you have all five of your rights done. When you come into the room, you certainly wanna make sure you have the right patient. So you're gonna ask their name and date of birth. Uh, Mr. Sample, can you tell me your name and date of birth? I'm gonna check that against my MAR and then I'm gonna compare my MAR to my wristband. And now I'm gonna do my third and final check as I'm getting ready to administer them. So the first thing I'm gonna give is a Percocet tablet. Just a tablet, it can be crushed without any difficulty. So you may want to uh, make sure that you're only gonna get one of them. Ms. Turner, is the other type of tablet that we can't crush are like those colace ones that are kind of like a gel? Yes. Yes, so you don't want to certainly crush anything that has liquid in the middle of it because you're not going to, uh, you're just going to make a mess and they're not going to get their medication. So you don't want to crush that as well. So depends on where you work, what type of crusher you have. This you actually put it in there, twist it, and it's going to crush it up. Sometimes you kind of pound it and crush it. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways. So all I'm going to do is put this in here and then I'm going to crush it. One thing I have to say about crushers is, you wanna make sure this is clean before you get started. If there's leftover tablets in it, it could be who knows what kind of medication. You don't wanna crush it along with this medication and give it to Mr. Sample, and now he's getting part of a high blood pressure medication, part of a cholesterol medication, and now we're actually doing a medication error and giving him the wrong medication. So make sure it's clean before you start, and then best practice is you clean it when you're done, so hopefully when the next person picks it up, it's clean. So all I'm gonna do is put that tablet in there after I've done my uh, checking. You're just gonna kind of go back and forth with this. Gotta untwist it a little bit sometimes, move it around. And then hopefully you have this nice powdery substance in here. You might have to go back and forth with this a couple times because if you have big chunks, sometimes you can clog your peg tubes or your feeding tubes with the medication. So sometimes you open it up, you still got some uh, 
big chunks in there, you want to kind of go back and forth and try to grind that up as much as you can. What you're then going to do is put it in your uh, medication cup, or you can use a small styrofoam cup, small plastic cup, uh, whatever you want, you're going to put it in, and you're going to add some water to this to get it to dissolve, okay? This, you know, state uh, regulations when you're giving meds through, med, meds through a peg tube is that you give them individually, okay? That's very time consuming, but that is the state recommendation. So if state ever comes to your work, that's what you're going to do. What you're going to see being done in practice is you put them all in one cup and you administer them all together. Now this patient might have five pills, a couple capsules, and a couple liquids. Usually what I do is I do all the pills and capsules together in one, and then I do all the liquids together in one cup, okay? So I got my tablet there. Now I got my clindamycin capsule, and the capsule doesn't need to be crushed because what you're actually going to do is you're gonna just open it and let the contents out. So here, uh, you're gonna see this too in lab. You're gonna be able to actually pull this apart and the powder medication inside.